This is the Aftermarket Radio Network. Welcome, everyone, to yet another episode of Diagnosing the Aftermarket A to Z. I'm Matt Fonslow, and once again, I have my good friend and colleague, Sean Tipping, joining me from the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. And today, we're going to be talking about the rapidly advancing world of AI in the automotive industry and how it will affect jobs, or our jobs, really, as automotive diagnosticians. Yeah, it's definitely an exciting time to be in the industry, but also a bit of a scary one. With all the advancements in AI, it's hard not to wonder what the future holds for us. Absolutely. So, Sean, can you give us an idea of how AI is currently being used in the automotive industry? One of the most obvious examples is in the development of autonomous vehicles. Companies like Tesla, Waymo, and Cruise are all working on fully autonomous cars that use AI to navigate and make decisions on the road. But AI is also being used in other areas like predictive maintenance, which allows vehicles to automatically identify potential problems before they occur, and for advanced driver assistance systems, which help to improve safety and make driving more convenient. Yeah, that's really interesting. And how do you see AI impacting our roles as diagnosticians in the future? Well, on one hand, it's going to make our jobs a lot easier with the ability to predict problems before they occur and diagnose issues quickly and accurately. AI will be able to take on a lot of the routine diagnostic tasks that we currently do. But on the other hand, it could also make our jobs obsolete. With AI being able to diagnose and fix problems on its own, it's possible that we'll see a decline in the need for human diagnosticians. Do you think there will be any challenges to overcome as AI becomes more integrated in the automotive industry? Absolutely. One of the biggest challenges will be ensuring that the AI systems are safe and reliable. As we've seen with some recent accidents involving autonomous vehicles, there are still a lot of technical and regulatory issues that need to be addressed. Additionally, there will also be concern about data privacy and security, as well as the potential impact on jobs and the broader economy. Well, that's all the time I have for today's episode. Thanks for joining us, Sean, and for sharing your insights on the impact of AI on the automotive industry. Thanks for having me, Matt. It's definitely an exciting time to be in the industry, and I'm looking forward to seeing how AI continues to shape the future of the automotive sector. How was that for a really short podcast? It's perfect. We're done. I, yeah, we're done. <laughs> call, call yeah, it was really good. <laughs> I mean, uh, I guess to uh, let the cat out of the bag a little bit, that was the only time anything is, well, other than my Napa ads, I've never read a script ever before in my life. And that's what we just got done doing there, Sean. Yeah. About five minutes before we went live here, I uh, generated that. Well, I shouldn't even say I generated. I prompted a thing we'll be talking about tonight, the chat GPT, to create a podcast episode between me and you discussing AI and the automotive industry. So we'll go into a little bit more detail about that after I read another script for everyone. <laughs> but this time it's to thank uh, our sponsor, Napa Auto Care. And really, you know, they're the ones that make this possible. Accomplish more by starting now. That's the motto of Repair Shop of Tomorrow, a Napa Auto Care exclusively endorsed vendor. Repair Shop of Tomorrow will look at productivity, efficiencies, effective labor rate, average hours per car, labor profit percent, measure and manage labor and how you can create net profit. Interested in Repair Shop of Tomorrow? Call 440-545-1230 for a free 20-minute no-obligation consultation or contact your servicing Napa Auto Parts store. All right, so we're done with the scripts. It is crazy. It, uh, it pumped that thing out in about five seconds with a simple prompt of podcast, Matt and Sean, AI and the automotive industry. And that's, that's what it came up with. And yeah, we, we read that, you know, word for word as it made it, but wild, crazy stuff. I've been kind of obsessed about this, uh, the last week or so watching videos and reading stuff on, uh, specifically the chat GPT. So that's kind of the big front and center lately, but AI in general. For those listening, if you've never heard of chat GPT, it's chat G is in like golf, P is in Papa, T is in Tango. I believe it stands for like chat generative pre-trained transformer or something like that. And it's a artificial intelligence. I don't want to call it a search bar though. You, you type in something like either a question 
or ask it to do something. So in this case, Sean asked it to write a script for a podcast between two professional automotive diagnosticians about the effect of AI. That's what it generated in seconds. It was released in like November, this version. Uh, so the, I think this is version three. It was released in November of this year, and I've only really seen it starting to get discussed hardcore within the last month or two. If you go on YouTube, there's a video of Channel 4 News in like Great Britain interviewing ChatGPT, uh, and they made it so it could talk. So it was a female voice responding, and okay, yeah, you could tell it's not human yet. Uh, some of the stuff blow your freaking mind. So I felt like what well, we just rattled off that script, pretty good. I mean, you could kind of sense that we were reading something and you could sense that we probably didn't come up with it ourselves because we just don't talk that way. And there's some stuff that was repeated a little bit, but it was pretty freaking good for five seconds. For fun, I've been doing stuff like the interview like that or the podcast type stuff. I've asked it to do a presentation of a automotive mechanic to a young auto mechanic, or I think I use novice, novice mechanic about basic electricity. It's pretty good. I asked it to write like a four page article. I don't know if it was really what it gave me it was four pages. I have to paste it in like word or something just to see and word counts just to see if it would actually be four pages in like a magazine or something. Um, but I asked it to do four pages on artificial intelligence, uh, another one on ADOS, another one on electricity. I did one uh, article on starting and charging system testing on modern automobiles. And okay, if you really want to get down to brass tacks, uh, an advanced tech would roll their eyes. But I've read articles like that in some of the trade rigs. I have really have read articles. It's like, you know what? If that showed up in one, I wouldn't think nothing of it. Somebody wrote it that just needed to churn out an article and fill space. It's nothing really wrong. Nothing really going to blow your freaking mind. You could read that and apply it. Mm -hmm. What the hell? This is version three. The significance of it being version three is that my understanding, and I could be wrong, but I'm almost positive that this version nor a version before it has access to real-time data. So it is not hooked up to the internet to pull updated data to what it already has. And what it's been fed has been very specific type things. Like if it did go to the internet, they, the programmers, if you will, kept it very, very um, specific spots. Like I don't know so much about Wikipedia, but it probably went to the Library of Congress. It probably went to certain databases, certain online books, stuff like that. And it's churning out material like this. What the hell? Yeah, my my understanding, and I probably have a very loose grasp on it. I've been trying to read up on it. Is that it got what they called a snapshot of the internet up to uh, the fall of twenty one, and nothing nothing real time after that point. You can reference, you know, cultural figures. I've seen some people like generate songs based off of a certain artist or an article written by someone, uh, you know, a cultural figure, and it will add, you know, some mannerisms in from a particular person while writing, you know, correct information. And I'm sure, you know, it's not 100% correct all the time, but what you're saying is like, this is in its infancy, like this is still, you know, early on and uh, seeing, seeing the future of this, uh, it's going to be crazy. And I, I thought it'd be a pretty good conversation for me and you to talk about, I mean, not just this in general, but specifically what's this mean for us and the automotive trade? How is this going to change things? Cause I, I'm pretty certain that it's going to. Yeah. I mean the, the listener Q and a that we had on your show, the, so that's the automotive diagnostic podcast. I think it's available on pretty much all the, uh, uh, podcast type listening platforms. Mm -hmm. Scott Shotton and I are on there with Sean on his show and he had listeners of his show submit questions and one of them pertained to artificial intelligence. And I, I answered it and I think I answered it fairly accurately and I don't think I've really changed my mind other than it's maybe sooner than I thought. Uh, some of the stuff I said is maybe going to happen a little bit sooner than I thought. I guess I, I think back to an interview with Lex Friedman 
and I've probably mentioned this a few times, but the reality is Lex Friedman was on Joe Rogan podcast. And this is a few years ago now. And Joe asked him, how far away is a fully autonomous vehicle? And he's like, you know, real, realistically 40, 50 years. Oh, wow, that long. Hey, driving is complex. And us as humans are very good at rejecting information while driving. That's not pertinent. As many accidents and stupid drivers as you know and see every day, as a whole, we do pretty good. So it's very complex. Almost a year later, and I know I was talking about this with Falco just recently, so that's a podcast episode coming up with Richard. We were talking about this, so I'm kind of repeating myself, unfortunately, but it's it's still relevant to what we're talking about now, and it's the reality. A year later from that first podcast... Lex is on Joe's pro- podcast again, and Joe asks him the same question. And the date changed. It's not 40 years anymore. It's more like 10. Like, that's how far they've come. And that's how f- hard it is to really get a grasp on the advances that machine learning is making. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, we don't really, I don't think we really know how it's learning. We just know that it does, right? So they give it, problems to work out so the the classic one i remember is um this is years ago already but it was a very small slice of the world alpha zero alpha zero was a like a derivative or a branch off of um watson and watson's that ibm ibm watson right and it was on um jeopardy and i think one time i went through and just got its butt handed to it and then it went through again and they kind of changed some things and it dominated uh, so Alpha Zero was a program, I think, powered a lot by, I could be wrong, I shouldn't even say, but I thought Google was heavily involved, but it's chess. It's a chess engine. And the story goes that they gave it the rules of chess. They taught it nothing. They showed it no openings, no you know middle game, end game strategies, nothing, no strategy whatsoever. These are the rules. Eight by eight board, 64 squares, white, black. These are the pieces. These are how they can move the rules. They gave it, I think, four hours to play itself over and over and over. And I don't know how many games it was, you know, hundreds of thousands, thousands, millions. I don't know. But that's how it taught itself. They let it play four hours, teach itself how to play. In four hours, it was the most powerful chess engine on the planet. It smoked what was like the... The chess engine, I think it was called Stockfish. That was the strongest chess engine on the planet until Alpha Zero had four hours to study. You watch the games and maybe you have to know a little bit about chess, a little bit, not a lot, but you watch the games, the way it played. I mean, it's scary. It's scary how it played because you're watching it just um, hemorrhage material, sacrifice, sacrifice, but it's playing a strategy of putting you into almost like handcuffs and you, you know, even seasoned players watching masters, watching grandmasters watching going like, what in the hell is it doing? And then all of a sudden you just see their eyes, everything changes, the complexion, everything changes. Like, so 12 moves ago, 14 moves ago, 20 moves ago, it makes this, makes this little move that seems totally irrelevant and it completely locks up the other side. It, It was playing a game less about, forcing you into like mistakes or waiting you out to make a mistake and open up uh, certain exchanges and more about locking you down to where you no longer could move where you wanted to move or it's the most insane thing you've ever seen in your life. That was alpha zero. Then they came up with alpha go, which go is a game that I'm not all that familiar with, but it's supposed to have exponentially more uh, positions and available moves and complex like, Really good Alpha Go players are really good and nobody really knows why they're really good. But the same scenario, it's the same scenario. It destroyed everybody. The best Go players, I don't think they necessarily know how it learns. We're talking about true, true potential artificial intelligence and consciousness. (laughs) The consciousness part, that's that's even wilder than just the the raw power of something like this tying it back to our industry a manufacturer or a company in general who wants to fix cars could easily give it the rules of the game right especially somebody who built the car 
okay, I, I made the car. I have all the proprietary information on how this module works and all the circuits inside of this control module and how this computer strategy works. We're going to put this in. Here's the rules, okay? Figuring out what's wrong with the vehicle at that point is like you say, it's it's going to be a snap. It'll it'll ha- be four steps ahead of anyone trying to figure this out on their own, a human on their own. But yeah, what does that look like in the future? You bring a car in with a misfire. Okay, we know a single cylinder misfire. You and I can sit here and talk, and we know that there's only a finite number of things that can cause that. But I don't. I couldn't tell you just right off the cuff how how many exactly. Is it twenty? Is it fifty? Is it a hundred? I mean, I, I don't know. We, we'd have to sit and start rattling stuff off. And then if we're recording this and we come up with 32, we might get a few messages and emails and phone calls saying, Hey dude, you forgot about this. Oh crap. Okay. Well now we're up to 40. We're up to 42. It's an important number, right? 42, 42 possibilities for this uh, single cylinder misfire. And we had to spend uh, quite a few minutes and have outside input to get to it. This just knows. Single cylinder misfire. It knows there are only this many possibilities. And now I, it could rule out this many based off of what code's set or what code's not set. Yeah, sensor data. Right. And then if it looks at some scan data, maybe it can rule it down to really there's three, there are now three possibilities. And I'm not saying a human couldn't do the same, but I'm thinking speed, sheer speed, three possibilities. And then can it determine it through, I hate to just say onboard diagnostics data, but onboard data, or is it going to need you or me or probably not you or me, you and me are going to be, I don't know what we're going to be doing. (laughs) Honestly. We'll just be talking on a podcast. (laughs) Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. (laughs) Although that script, we're in trouble, man. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Maybe it needs a, a lackey to make a few connections to for some sort of off board Mm -hmm. put the meter here whether we get to see the meter result or not is beside the point it's going to you know ask you to make these connections and if it doesn't like what it sees it might ask you to check again and maybe there's a camera on there it can look and say well okay it's, it's actually connected and according to you know my circuit loading he it's a it's a good connection boom this is what's bad and accuracy will be in what 99 high, high 99 percentile. And once in a great while it won't get it. And I don't know, maybe they just bust out the shotgun until they fix it. And then it logs that as a possibility, probably for sure. In the early stages, there will be a human, there will be Sean Patrick Tippin getting flown to, you know, Red Wing, Minnesota to help some idiot in the Bay trying to figure <laughs> out why this car runs terrible. And the AI systems failing is, you know, had me slam a bunch of parts on it. Didn't work. And then you go find the flaw. You're basically working yourself out of a job. Yeah. As you, as you add to the, the knowledge base with every fix for sure. You know, they said this chat GTP had access to the internet and I don't know in what capacity or where exactly that it, you know, had access to the information. You know, this is a language model they called it. Right. And so these models do need something to pull from and then okay yeah there's learning on that but they need the information to pull from in the first place and for us it's where will that initial information come from you know is a company like identifix going to create something because they have a massive archive of information and now they're the producers of some system or model that's able to work in one specific area, right? This is the AI for figuring out what's wrong with your car. Or is it going to be something broader where there's enough info free on the internet right now, YouTube, Google, forums, all that stuff that, you know, something could just pull from that and and be able to accomplish something. I, I was just trying to think of like where and how it's getting the information. And then, you know, there's probably you know, legalities involved at some point or another. Well, I mean, I would think it can access anything and everything on the internet, like, uh, of course, print. And print's probably what it could handle the the fastest, the easiest. I got to believe that it has no problem or will have very little problem with video. So now all of YouTube is available. And yes, there's absolute crap on YouTube, like 
Thankfully, Scotty Kilmer is going to make the AI system dumber. So Scotty Kilmer has just gained a new fan. He, he turned out to be the savior of the automotive industry. Yeah, he, he dumbed down the AI system. Woo! When you flip that thing on, it says, let's rev up our engines. <laughs> And that in like movies like Fast and Furious, you know, if it, the system sees that, it's going to have people checking the welds on their intakes and all that. But one fear with AI is always going to be like Terminator series or the Matrix. I don't know. I I got a rough time for sure in our lifetimes that it's ever going to come to that. I, I mean, I know I know Morgan is down assembling his arsenal and cleaning it all. He's ready. So he, I hope he adds on to his house at least another bedroom because uh, that's where I'm going. Because if, if the machines are coming, that's the safest place, I, I think. There's a few rednecks out here by me I might <laughs> hit up. but <laughs> um, So I, I don't know how reasonable I see that, but I do see a problem for us. I don't know if it'll hit us in our careers, but maybe the next generation coming up that it will really be in the bays and really be effective. And I don't know if it'll be so much like in the bays, in the bays. I feel like I'm jumping around a lot here, but it, it all pertains. We're going to have the artificial intelligence of the onboard diagnostic system and or maybe an offboard system that communicates with the onboard system. You'd have to go back a ways, maybe watch some reruns. I was pretty little when it was on, but Night Rider. And so you had Kit, which was the black Trans Am. And the technician that serviced at least the earlier episodes, I think her name was Bonnie, would talk to him. And she still had test equipment and all that, but she was interacting with Kit. And he had an opinion on what might be wrong with him. That seems somewhat reasonable to me. I don't know if it'll actually talk talk. I don't know if it'll be through like a headset or some other interface. And then we also have Neuralink. We're essentially cyborgs right now. Via our phones, via computers, we're connected to each other and information sources and entertainment sources and stuff like that. The interface sucks, right? It's slow. Neuralink will speed that way up. Maybe that's how it'll work. I I, I don't know. You got to be a mechanic. You got to get this thing embedded in your skull. Well, wouldn't that be fantastic if you just asked the car a question? I mean, we do in a way, right? That's our tests and that's our scan tools and all that stuff. But I remember the first time I saw um, this module pop up on the scan tool, the human machine interface control module, right on a GM. I, I saw that the first time I was like, well, that's an odd name, but you know, for it, but think of it literally, it is a module that is meant to interface with you using a language model to say, yeah, it's two days ago, this thing didn't start. Here's the battery voltage and here's what the voltages on the network look like at that time. You know, even if it doesn't talk, like it puts it out there for you because it's been trained to feedback information or, you know, just like this chat GPT thing uh, I'm finding so far, it's all in the way that you prompt it, right? You give it the prompt and it does something pretty cool in the future. Figuring out what's going on with the car is knowing what questions to ask um, or how to ask them to get the information that you need. I, I hadn't thought about it like that, where there'd be a, an individual unit on the vehicle. The other thing, and I think you brought this up the other day when we were talking outside of the car, this uh, chat thing has been talked a lot about for students and schools and stuff, basically creating essay, for instance, for a student in seconds and with some iterations, it looks pretty good. That's going to be something for us too, Um, and good and bad. It's good that we can get information, but I think in the mid section here, the growing section well, we're still in today, 2023, and moving towards this wild, crazy future, people will utilize this, right, to say, hey, look at me, I'm an expert. Ask me a question, boom, got it, right here, here's the answer. Uh, Once this is more, you know, dedicated towards specific automotive, like you said, you can look up stuff now and you can tell, okay, it's pretty pretty base level, but accurate, and it's only going to get better. And so where I think you were going with it when we talked was how do you know what's out there now? Is that actually, you know, a human's expertise and perspective? Hey guys, 
Matt here talking to you about what the Napa Auto Care Center program can do for your business. You probably already know the Napa brand is the most recognized and trusted name in the automotive aftermarket industry. In fact, studies show nearly 95% of customers recognize Napa and associate it with quality parts, service, and technical expertise. So why not complete a Pro Image upgrade and take advantage of that? Pro Image is a co-branding program for the exterior and interior of your shop. On the outside, it includes the Napa colors and distinctive Napa signage. While the public may know you as a reliable, locally owned business, a Pro Image upgrade helps set your shop apart from the competition even further. It is also a visual signal to your customers and potential customers that you and Napa are partners. Most importantly, Pro Image really works. This co-branding opportunity has helped Napa Auto Care Centers across the country increase their car counts and sales. In fact, those that have completed the ProImage project enjoy an average of 23% sales increase during their first year. ProImage upgrades are also available for the interior of your shop. A ProImage interior upgrade transforms your customer waiting area from merely utilitarian to warm and welcoming. The goal is to maintain your shop's independent identity while enhancing the customer's experience. You can get a free look at what a Pro Image exterior or interior upgrade can look like by visiting the Napa Auto Care member site and clicking on the Napa Pro Image link under the Napa Pro Image tab. Or contact your local Napa Auto Parts store. Your servicing Napa store can tell you more about Pro Image plus the hundreds of other reasons to become part of the Napa Auto Care family, the largest network of independent auto repair shops in the country. To finish the thought with the um, AI in our bays, maybe the next generation is artificial intelligence, as far as I can tell, especially in the way we're talking about it. So the, the Watsons in the medical field, Watson I've heard about for like the um, airliners or stuff like that, where they um, predict failures. Uh, so stuff gets replaced before it breaks. And then, of course, would help in diagnostics. And then the medical field is that... It usually goes after the higher, for complete lack of a better term, the smart people. That's the jobs it's going to take. Higher level, I guess, deductive reasoning type of thing. Those are the jobs that are going to be endangered by artificial intelligence. And then to kind of go with what you were saying there with kids using it in school, I feel like we've been fighting that for decades with encyclopedias, you know, plagiarism. Now it's going to be a lot harder to point at, you know, I I punched in this question into this chat box. It spat out a response and I repeated it to somebody and I plagiarized chat GPT. Oh yeah, prove it. Because if you ask the same question, I don't know if it's recording a history of how you ask questions or I ask questions and answers it gives. Is it very standardized? Because then if it is, you might be able to prove it. But I think we've always kind of fought that. You know, whether it was an encyclopedia, whether it was somebody just sitting talking to an expert, asking them a question and writing them down what they said verbatim, that's an issue. But what I really don't like outside of academia and and something we already see with Scotty Kilmers, with so many other people, whether they're on YouTube or uh, uh, forums or whatever is fake competency. So we as experts or you're an expert. I don't know what the hell I am. Not an expert, but we watch Scotty Kilmer and we cringe. It's cringe. It's so bad. And there's so many other things we watch. That's so bad, but they've got hundreds of thousands or thousands or millions of followers that think they are the greatest thing since sites spread. Oh my God. I wish, I wish there was a mechanic like Scotty Kilmer down the street from me. I would take everything to him because he's so honest and he's so good. And it's not just him. That's just outright. That's an expert or somebody that's fairly educated could watch that and go, that guy doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. And then there's others that I'm not going to say they are or aren't because I can't tell. I don't think anyone could tell unless you know them personally and you've been there and you know them and you've, you've watched them work outside of video because they could video the process like, oh, I got this car in. It's been to 75 different shops they couldn't figure it out now it's here and i'm gonna walk you through this and boom 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 you watch the video and it looks like a very linear logical process from point a to point b and they diagnosed it even as an expert 
watch that and go like, well, yeah, they went about that really smart. That's, but you don't get to see everything. I want to be very clear. They maybe did do it that way. Or even if they didn't, the big picture is, is they're showing you a process. The issue is, is if they didn't take that path and it was riddled with mistakes and miscues and misdiagnostics and, you know, parts replacements that didn't fix it and all that. We don't see any of that. We only saw the good stuff that makes them look like experts. And you watching it can't tell the difference. There's no way to do it. And now they have a large group of people, both novice, amateur, professional, expert level, master levels, suspecting that, hey, they're, they're pretty smart. They know what they're doing. They're, they're experts. And now with this system, depending on the situation, it's easy to feign competency. And how are you going to determine true competency? You have somebody working tech support. They know how to type. That's what they know how to do. They couldn't fix a sandwich, but you're calling them with tech support or emailing or however that works, calling them for tech support. Oh, just a sec. Let me think about this or let me pull up a diagram. Open GPT. Here comes the answer. They rattle it off and you're like, oh yeah, okay. And it ends up fixing it. And you're like, next time I call, I want to make sure I talk to Matt. He knows what he's talking about. And Matt's in here punching everything into chat box. That's a big problem. So I think artificial intelligence attacks the jobs and careers of the specialists, the diagnosticians, the, 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 where you need inductive and deductive reasoning type of stuff. Those jobs are in danger because that's where artificial intelligence can shine. Automation is going to go after the unskilled, uh, the unskilled jobs, unskilled positions, repetitive type of work, non-dexterous. Those are the jobs that automation takes away. So now we've created this bracket and people in the middle and you're going to have, now you're going to have smart people out of a job looking at dexterous tasks or, or whatever that automation can't take yet. And AI could tell you what to do, but it can't do it right. We're not going to have robots crawling up into people's attics to run duct work. Not yet. That's going to be a ways off. They're not going to be pulling cable. A lot of jobs on a car. They're probably, I think you said it the other day, they're not going to be pulling dashes. That, and not anytime soon. Right, right. I should not sell my ball joint press yet. That's what you're saying. I should hang on to that thing. I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe tomorrow you're going to send me a YouTube video and we're both going to cry. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, yeah, the robotics thing's a whole other thing. But yeah. It's not just going to affect our industry either. You know, obviously that's our focus. That's our world. That's what we care about. How does it affect us? It's going to be so many different industries once this gets utilized. And I mean, that's the thing is I would imagine a lot of companies will invest a lot of money in this because it's big money, right? You get a a system to do all this work for you accurately um, without sleep and (laughs) biological issues and it's going to make them a lot of money. So it's going to be all over the place, right? It's going to be in every industry. And so, yeah, what do all these people do that are suddenly potentially not needed um, for what they have specialized in uh, for their careers? Uh, It's that's the stuff that I've really been thinking about. Like, yeah, I wrestle with that a lot. Yeah. I, I don't know. I know a lot of really smart people. I don't think they could fix cars for a living. I don't think they could be electricians. I could be completely full of crap. Maybe it, maybe that's an an arrogant thought on my part, but their brains don't work that way. And I don't know if they could learn it. They will find something though. It's the unskilled. I don't know what they're going to do. I I have no idea what they're going to do. Do you think there's going to be a big resistance to this? Like a large group of people that says, no, you can't turn this thing on. It's our jobs. I think you're seeing it from the truckers already, you know, and I think there's, you know, I definitely do not want to go down a political road with this, but, you know, you've had people running for office like uh, Andrew Yang flat out saying like listening to leaders or whoever saying that if um, autonomous driving takes over long haul driving, they now have the benefit of being able to run 24 hours a day. They have the ability to probably not be in any car accidents or very, very minimal car accidents. These truckers being able to go and get retrained into writing the code for the 
truck that just take, took their job is wildly, wildly untrue. A very, very, very small fraction of them can do that. And I even wonder, like, you know, take the really, really smart auto mechanics. How many of them could really write code? I know some do already. Like, there's definitely some. You start thinking about the grand scheme and the big picture. How many of them really could? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I don't want to make it sound condescending either, even. It's just a real question I have. How many really could do it? I don't trust that I could. I don't know that I could learn Python. I don't know that I could learn JavaScript. Maybe I'm selling myself short. That would be nice. I, I, that would be, that'd be a very pleasant surprise for me. I have a doubt. Yeah, you can probably do that stuff out of necessity, but yeah, is that what you want to do, right? Uh, a lot of us do this because we're passionate about it, and I, I don't see writing code to, to equal that same passion for me. And writing code was a bad example because chat GPT is already spitting out code, right? Coders working for Google and Elon Musk and all that have asked it to write code. I think I, I didn't watch the video. I'm going to. Somebody built a website a hundred percent off code generated by chat GPT. Like I said, I haven't watched it. So maybe the website's jacked. All I know is that coders have given chat GPT coding issues and it spit back code that worked. I'm not saying it fixed the issue completely. Like you said earlier, many a couple times already, it's not always right, but it's version three. It's scary. It's scary and cool. I'm in the same boat. Like, wow, this is so cool at the same time. Yeah, it's really, really scary to think of the potential outcomes, right? You look way towards the future and this this thing, this AI has taught itself how to learn. It can prompt itself and its comprehension is beyond what we can understand. We are now second place as humans and we've never been that way in thought, uh, and, you know, brain capacity. That's never been the case and it, it might be. And so what do we do then? Um, and I was just trying to think of like, you know, what is life for humans? Yeah. Maybe some really rare Facebook watch videos that there's some humans that are second place, but as a whole, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. As a whole, you're absolutely right. But like you were saying, yeah, is it the Skynet uh, Terminator future or is it more of something like, you know, I have my dog here and I, I love my dog, but she's not really the smartest, <laughs> you know, she, if I, if I close the door to this room, she won't be able to get out and she'll starve and die. Right. And, and that's a simple task for me. Is that how the AI is going to look at us? I don't know if pets is the right word, but you know, just that difference in, you know, intellect and capacity. Now, now we're, we're second place. Well, I'm torn. It's either like ex machia or machia or- I think that's required viewing. Yes. Uh, it's, I, I think that's one of those required viewing. Everyone should have to watch Idiocracy. Everyone should have to watch <laughs> yeah. Ex Machia. Well, in Idiocracy, they had the robot in the hospital, just like you were talking yeah. about, right? Yeah, Just press exactly. the buttons on it. That's what's wrong. <laughs> and then if he gets the probes right. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it's going to be like. Even on a car, the, the human's going to screw up where the probes go. <laughs> <laughs> and then the diagnosis will be all the same. But it's like, hey, man, you're, you're messed up. <laughs> if you could just sign that. One idea I have of what will happen is that AI won't be, an AI automation, robots, all that won't be necessarily evil. It won't be something like Terminator and it won't be something like the Matrix um, where AI and robots and all that used us as energy sources that we got, we did end up in a Terminator type battle and then we blocked out the sun because that was their main source of energy was solar. So we, you know, ruined the atmosphere to block the solar. So then they started using us as Duracells. I don't know if it'd be so dystopian like that, but my idea is dystopian in the fact that because there's going to be so many humans that will not be able to have careers a, because of lack of skill. The other is they just don't need it. It's all going to be automated. And I, I think there was a kind of a very ultra positive outlook on the future where we don't have to work. We are born and we get to live and we get to live is, you know, sightsee travel, you know, 
VRs if you want to watch Ready Player One, which should also be recommended, if not required viewing of every human being. You know, maybe we do spend the vast majority of our time in the Matrix, like, you know, with the VR headsets online, something of that nature in virtual reality. I, but I think what will happen is people need a purpose. I don't know. I just don't know that we can, even if tomorrow I was told like, hey, you know what? All your stuff's going to be taken care of. Like you don't have to, even if you win the lottery almost, you, you don't have to worry about your bills. You don't have to work anymore. You're going to be able to afford to do things. You want to be able to afford to go traveling, whatever. Because now there's really no purpose for you. We don't need you to fix cars anymore. We don't need you to really do anything productive. Not that I'm productive anyways, but regardless, I would think for a while traveling the world would maybe be really cool, but eventually you're kind of like, yeah, I got to do something. I got to feel like I'm accomplishing something. And I think that's where the wheels fall off. No, you're 100% correct. Is that purpose that so many people get that through their careers or just work hard work in general, right? And we're, we're hardwired that way. We're built that way. That's what we seek out, right? You look at the billionaires, right? Like uh, Elon Musk has got all the money in the world and he still works his ass off all the time, right? There's, there's obviously a drive, like we need to do this stuff. And when that's not there, there's no purpose. And I think you do see that in a lot of people today, just with technology, the way it is, right? Technology, if you go back a hundred years, has made our life significantly easier where we don't have to worry about the mundane or so many mundane, hard tasks. So we got a lot more time to think about all the other stuff that makes us anxious and triggered or whatever. All You know, like you see that stuff coming up. And I think a lot of it's because there's a lack of, of purpose um, in people's lives. So then, yeah, that's exacerbated by, you know, not having, not having careers. Um, I think it was uh, uh, Jordan Peterson, talked about, you know, everybody dreams about going to sit on a beach and drink margaritas. Like that's, that's a lot of people's, you know, fantasy for maybe retirement or, or a vacation, or if I won the lottery, well, how long are you actually going to do that for three days, a week, two weeks, you know, you're going to get pretty bored of just sitting on a beach drinking margaritas. You're going to want, you know, something more. And so that, that'll be an interesting thing to see how, you know, yeah, human life transitions to, to figure that stuff out. Uh, and I'm not smart enough to really know how that works out, but like you get into the currency type thing, you know, whether it's, you know, money, money represents money isn't worth anything except what we associate, right? The only reason money means anything is because we all agree it's worth something. That's it. That's the only thing. And maybe pre currency you had bartering, right? And we still have that, right? I mean, we, you come out, come over and help me do this. I'll go over there and help you do that or lend you this or give you that or whatever. There's going to be people that still produce something, whatever that is. I don't know what it would be, but there's still going to be people that produce something, maybe art. It's going to have value. Well, how are you going to, how are you going to get it? How are you going to do the exchange? Not going to be just any one thing. There's going to be a group of things. So now I just wonder how that gets handled because it's easy to say like everything's automated, you know, the main things like food, shelter, water, it's all automated. Nobody has to do anything. We don't need farmers anymore. We only maybe need a few technicians that are relatively what we would consider relatively unskilled, but they're going to have jobs. So they're going to have to do better than somebody that doesn't have a job. And I don't know what better means. Right. So now we still have hierarchies going and depending on the hierarchy, well, we, we could go down a real rabbit hole with this, but if people start deeming the hierarchy unfair, then we got problems. Like right now, we, I think that's the big thing with the current hierarchy with the um, income disparity as people are looking at it going like, okay, it's wildly unfair. And now you have people on the bottom who aren't trying to fix the hierarchy. They're trying to destroy it. And that's, that's bad too, because hierarchies are just a natural occurrence. They're going to happen whenever somebody produces something or more than one person produces something really. But I don't, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, it's just kind of wondering how that plays out. And I don't have to worry about going to work 
Um, everything's automated. So maybe I don't really have to pay for my electricity anymore and I don't have to go pay for my food. But then how does that work out? You just go in and grab whatever you want or you get, what are they called? Like C notes or. What, what it makes me think of is, I don't know how familiar you are with a Star Trek and obviously it's a TV show, but they, you know, displayed a pretty utopian, um, view of human civilization, I don't know, a thousand plus years in the future. Right. And they had gone done away with currency. And that was sort of the thing is like, yeah, you just, you get food from the replicator and th- it, there was no pay or anything like that, but people were still, you know, looking for that purpose, right. Fulfilling a purpose, like going out and exploring the universe and all that stuff. And I don't know if that's, that's what we're going to have to do, man. I have to bar- start building the ship right now. I have to build the ark. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, you know, that, that was my other thought is there's going to be, like I said, there's going to be a lot of people, I think, that will resist this. When the AI overlords have the pets, they'll be the domesticated and the feral humans. And <laughs> so <laughs> if you're domesticated, you got a pretty easy life. You could lay around all day, but um, there'll, be, uh, there'll be plenty of feral ones too. So I, I honestly don't know which side I'd be on. Ah, man, I don't know. Maybe they can like upload me to one of the robots and then I can infiltrate it from the inside. <laughs> <laughs> Once it starts, it starts dropping uh, movie quotes, um, we'll, uh, we'll know Fonzel is in there. Yeah, that's, <laughs> he's a robot that only speaks in movie quotes. <laughs> For more stuff on this, uh, YouTube has a growing amount of info, but what I found extremely intriguing was one, um, Ryan Reynolds reads off a ad. So he went to a chat GPT and asked it to write him an ad that featured, um, a joke, a swear word, um, mentioning that they have whatever, uh, special still running on after the other um, company stopped doing it. So it's for his, um, he must own like a cell phone company. Oh yeah. Yeah. I have heard of that mint mobile or something like that. And so he has chat GPT write this uh, ad for him and he reads it off and okay. Yeah. It's not the best ad he's ever had. It's pretty good. Like it did what he asked. It went for some easy stuff, but still like, it turned it out in a few seconds. It did exactly what he asked. It wasn't horrific. I mean, I think it just gives you an idea. Um, there's other ones with Jordan Peterson, his comments on it. I, I really like those. And I would say I echo a lot of what he said. Um, Brett Weinstein spoke about it on the Joe Rogan experience. Stuff that's hard to ignore. Stuff that's intriguing to think about. Like Part of it's like, what a what a time to be alive, man. What a time to be alive. Well, I was thinking about that the other day. You know, we're the last generation of people prior to the internet. And and we get to see all this stuff happening, too, all in one lifetime. That's crazy. This is insane, right? It's just insane. There's a lot of stuff on there. There's, a, I think there's one where a coder does ask it for coding help. And I haven't watched it yet, so I don't know what the results were. Um, I don't know that this was... The chat GTP, it might have been, but the somebody made an interview between Joe Rogan and Steve Jobs, and I listened to that, and that was absolutely crazy because, yeah, again, you can tell like okay, it sounds it sounds a little, you know, scripted or a little clunky, but not that much. Um, and, and had you not listened to enough actual Joe Rogan podcast, and you didn't know Steve Jobs was dead. Um, you would have thought, oh yeah, this is just kind of an awkward interview between a couple of people. And so, yeah, it's even encroaching into the artistic side or the creative side of things too. Yeah. It, it's not a hundred percent. Like I, I had to try to analyze lyrics. So like I did Metallica's one, it did a pretty good job. It seemed very realistic about analyzing the lyrics and their meaning. Then I had to try to do, um, Slipknot's, um, Slipknot's Devil and I, and it actually did duality and it was okay. So it didn't even do the right song. And then I had it do, um, kill switch engage Rose of Sharon. And it's, it was like contradicting itself, like kill switch engage. Uh, this is a song by kill switch engage, um, 
a metalcore band, but it's not. They didn't write it. They didn't sing it. It's, it, it was like totally lost. And then I'm like arguing with it. <laughs> I was arguing with it and it, did, it didn't matter. It, oh, wow. You're right, Matt. <laughs> Thank you. It just kept kind of tweaking its responses to go from like, it is incorrect that Rose of Sharon was written by and performed by a kill switch engage. My data only goes up to this point and I've not found anything that implies that this is a song by a kill switch engage. So it's not always spot on. It can be off quite a bit. Like I said that, you know, analyze the lyrics of Metallica, uh, the song one by Metallica and, uh, it was pretty good. I mean, it was more than just a little more in depth than just looking at a couple lyrics and saying, you know, oh, it's somebody, a soldier who lost their limbs and, you know, the, the, and then, and it sucks and they want to die. It was more, much more in depth than that. I wouldn't say like crazy deep because it was like, I don't know, two, two decent sized paragraphs. I'll have to try that. I hadn't thought about doing something like that. I mean, I learned all I could learn about cars, so I stopped, I had to stop. I had to go and start asking it about other <laughs> stuff. I think I asked it, what scan tool should I use on a Ford? And it responded with a generic thing, like, you should be a professional and blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, the, the scan tool of choice for Fords is the IDS. Short of telling me where to go download it, was pretty. I was pretty impressed. Like, holy crap. Uh, I think I sent you the screenshot of asking it how to program a control module on a Chevrolet. And yeah, the details are kind of missing, but man, I get you, get you pointed in the right direction. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. We're going to have to keep our options open. I don't know. Maybe the podcast will just take off really good and we won't have to worry about it, but I don't, <laughs> <laughs> yours maybe will. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to end up in some blue collar job. Yeah. Robots aren't quite capable of doing just yet. I'm just wondering, like, if my kid started working on cars, would he or she? I don't know. I just kind of have a gut feeling like they get into their career very deep. They're just not going to have to know as much. They're, either the car itself, the onboard, offboard systems are going to walk them through things. And then as a, a manual laborer, to do the dexterous type stuff, they're going to have, you know, Google glasses or the top done augmented reality glasses, and they are going to basically show them how to do it. Here's where all the bolts are that you have to take out behind the dash. <laughs> Man, that'd be nice. And then, yeah. And then while you're wrenching on, it, it's going like, hey, right, you tell you, lefty, loosey, right? Just like you're doing that wrong. You're over torquing those. I meant to forget that, forget that bolt there. <laughs> yeah. That screw that goes in the back, you left that. It's under, under the seat. You get a comeback and it's going to go back through and see where you effed up. And how about a, a positive note? We've been kind of downers here <laughs> for the most part. What, what do you think is the most positive thing you see uh, for us in the auto world? It's going to benefit us the most. I mean, one, just witnessing it. If we get to witness this happen, I mean, that is going to be just jaw droppingly amazing. Just an unbelievable, just like you said, it's like Star Trek level stuff, if not further. I mean, even Star Trek Next Generation computer wasn't that cool. You know, maybe at the time when we're watching, it was pretty cool. But now with Siri and Google Assistant and all that, it isn't that good. Yeah, I always thought that was interesting. They made uh, data more, uh, well, he was he was sentient and, you know, uh, more of an actual AI than the computer on the ship. I was like, why couldn't they just make that with the computer on the ship? But maybe in the initial stages, it'll be better for us because we're going to have even more work. <laughs> and um, And maybe it'll help us learn more about the car than we thought. Like, depending... I guess I'm very interested on the interface. How is the interface going to happen? Is it going to be all text? Is it going to really be talking to us? That I'm kind of like, I have that image in my mind of Knight Rider and, you know, something's wrong with Kit walking up to the car and does the car have a name and is it a kind of a derivative of the VIN number or something like that or the, the customer named the car and you're walking up to it and saying, you know, access pin code, blah, blah, blah. 
hello, Camry 69. You know, and it's like, hello, Matt, how are you? Fine. So you have a uh, issue with cylinder number three. Yep. And blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I'm still opening the hood and maybe doing some testing, but I'm talking to the freaking car while I'm doing it. And it's giving me certain data, like freeze frame type data, but much more in depth. And, you know, the car's telling me, like, I've ruled out ignition. I've ruled out fuel delivery. I've ruled out cam timing. My database, my, uh, you know, th- top three possibilities are this, this, and this. And then I have to figure, I have to prove, you know, which one of the three is right, wrong, or uh, otherwise. And that's, that's kind of fascinating. Right. Uh, That's pretty fascinating. Oh, for sure. I think in the transition period, there will be a lot of opportunity uh, for people who are in this field and the specialists and the people with a lot of, you know, a wealth of experience. Because, um, like I was saying earlier, you know, it needs information to pull from, you know, it needs the criteria. And I think there'll be some opportunity for people to contribute in the development of it which would be a pretty cool opportunity to, um, you know, work on constructing something like this. Like, you know, how do you go about building a model that solves problems on a Toyota Camry? Um, that's a, that's a cool project just to, just to ponder how you would approach it. Um, so that, that sort of stuff definitely, definitely interests me. And I think it'll be pretty cool to see or, Maybe we'll know somebody who gets to be a part of it. Maybe you can have conversations with the car outside of working on the car. So you're, you know, busy checking power feeds and grounds at the ignition coil and asking it what it thinks about your fantasy football team or something like that. (laughs) Sure. Sure. (laughs) You should trade cousins as soon as possible. (laughs) Well, sir, I really appreciate you coming on and, This topic is fascinating. It was a great idea to have the beginning of the conversation be generated by artificial intelligence. And I'm guessing most people when they hear it on my end aren't going to be able to tell the difference. So they're going to be like, well, Matt's going to be replaced rather quickly. (laughs) Well, I appreciate you taking my call last week in a panic because I was like, I was like, I got to talk to Matt about this after I started using it. But thank you for having me on. I I definitely appreciate it, as always. Yeah, you're welcome anytime. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you again to Sean for stopping by the podcast. Thank you to the Aftermarket Radio Network. Uh, If you get a chance, check out the other shows. And uh, thank you to Nap Auto Care for sponsoring. And until next time, everyone, take care. You've been listening to Matt Fonslow diagnosing the aftermarket A to Z on the Aftermarket Radio Network. Follow Matt on your favorite listening app. He's very interested in what you have to say. Let him know what you'd like him to cover and come on the show. Matt is all for advancing the aftermarket. Find Matt Fonslow on social media and connect or on aftermarketradionetwork.com.